Sports 107.7, the end. An evening with Billy Corgan. My name is Marco Collins, and we're here at our secret undisclosed location. We still can't tell anybody because we don't want crazy crowds outside, but we're sitting in a room full of winners. How you guys doing? We're going to spend the going to spend the next hour doing an interview with Billy Corgan and ladies and gentlemen Darcy from the Smashing Pumpkins. Hey Billy. Very special surprise. We didn't uh, expect Darcy to be here with us today. Hey Darcy. How are you? I'm not really Darcy. I'm Billy's long lost cousin, cousin. Dora. Oh. God, you look a lot Dora like Darcy. From Iowa, yeah. That's why Darcy's in. in the band. <laughs> Thank you guys very much for uh, being a part of this and helping us set this thing up. Uh, what do you think of the location here? Do you mean the room? Here? The room. It's beautiful. It's really nice. Cool. Okay. I think I'm yeah. feeding back. No, it's just like it's just like the concert. Yeah. Right on. Uh, what it's we're gonna fire. do is we're gonna have a bunch of you folks be asking questions of uh, Billy and Darcy, and uh, there's some very excited fans here today. Those are beautiful flowers. Bill is going to walk around the room in a very Jenny Jones fashion and have you guys ask uh, the questions yourselves. So why don't we jump straight into this thing right now? Why, do you, why are we here? You're here to answer questions, uh, aren't you? okay. <laughs> Oh, I thought we were asking you questions. Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you can you're welcome to any time. If you have an interview question, you'd like to inter you could interview us. That's fine. Interview the listeners. What made you want to go into radio? <laughs> you know, I'm still asking myself that. Should so, we dive in? Yeah, I, I suppose we in. could Let's if people are ready to uh, uh, <laughs> ask questions. We've been talking about this. <laughs> There's some very excited fans Let's, here uh, tonight. Pumpkin okay, head. all right. Let's, let, let's get this guy over with here. What's your name? Who are you? I'm Murphy Kynes from Oklahoma. And I have really two good questions. Star Switch, does your necklace say? It says Carrie. Okay. And That's I'm, my real name. <laughs> and, like, do you still like the Sacred Heart and stuff? Um, nah, you know. We're over it. They're, They're over the over Sacred the Heart. Sacred heart. Okay, I was uh, heading over here. Good Did you question. have a question? <laughs> What's your name? Alexis Gentry. <laughs> Hi, Alexis. Hi. Oh, I'm from Stanwood. Hi, Stanwood. And um, I want... <laughs> You're just here to say hi. I want... To them, not us. I want... <laughs> don't worry. Don't be nervous. It's only going out to about a million people. <laughs> She's Your going mother right now is wondering why she put you through all those years of school, but... <laughs> What was your question? We'll get back to her. Don't worry. Okay, I'm Amy Euchre from Stanwood, and I want to know what you think when you, like, walk through the grocery store and you see, like, your face on a magazine. Um, what do you think? Usually I think, why was I wearing that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of what was I thinking, you know. Any, uh, any thoughts there, Darcy? It's usually like, why did they pick that horrible picture? <laughs> Is it something that you have no control over? Um, it depends on the situation, but usually it's like, um, well, we don't, can't really show you the photos because we're on a deadline and you guys are on tour and uh, it's a lot of that kind of thing. <laughs> What's it your name? It depends on whether or not the magazine likes you. you know? Oh, really? Yeah. What, what magazines in particular would you rather have your photograph? Uh, I will not allow Darcy <laughs> to answer no that names. question. Thank you. No names. What's your name? S Sir? And I was wondering if it, if it was weird for you to play the American Music Awards. It was kind of crazy, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it was like, like Lionel Brooks. Richie, Garth Brooks, and the Smashing Pumpkins. <laughs> it was you like, know, I was like, the Smashing that, Pumpkins. Right there, I mean, I don't even have to really say anything. And, then, like, and they had these weird, they had these weird, like, very TV show kind of sets, like, you know, because we were the rock band, they kind of had the rock <laughs> band set, you know, it was like, we could have been anybody, you know, Aerosmith or you know, something, you know. Is it one of those situations where it's hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, and, and actually, then wait? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, but, but actually, um, we thought it was going to be kind of weird and creepy, but actually, um, you know, got to meet Dick Clark, and everybody was really nice. So it, it was okay. It was just weird to be on that kind of show because you feel like you're the weird band in amongst the not weird bands. You know? What is it with Dick Clark still looking exactly the way he did years ago? Did he look like that close up? Yeah. He did. He didn't even look like he was wearing any makeup or anything. That's he looked wild. He, he looks great. He does? He looks great. 
Wow. He yeah, although exactly he, he does have same. oxygen tanks on his back. <laughs> I don't know if he's, he's, he's going right in intravenously or what, but... You know what I think it is? I think it's the exercising. He was wearing, like, a tuxedo black tie and, and, and tennis shoes. Wow. So, he what must does be that really sound? physically fit. No, no. That was just Bill. Forgive him. He had, <laughs> Excuse me. That must have been the bean that Mexican salad. dinner you had. <laughs> What's your name? My name is Cassie Meyer, and I was wondering... <laughs> Is it, like, cool or flattering to be in a room full of people who are totally obsessed with you, or is it scary? Um, well, the first question I would ask you is, why? And uh, the second question I would ask is, do oh, you have something better to do? And the third question I would ask is, thanks, and what? <laughs> That's not a question. No, it's, it's I mean, honestly, to, to be serious for a moment, um, it, I mean, we, we've worked at this for so long that you get to a point where you really appreciate people coming to see you and people coming being interested because it, it's been a long road. I mean, this was not, this did not happen overnight, so. It'd, Certain, be, worse, you know, it'd be worse if, if we weren't in a room full of people who like Yeah, exactly. Put it that way. <laughs> that, that would feel suck. a lot worse. That is cool that you guys have that attitude, though, because a lot of people, I think, when they reach the size of the size the pumpkins are at this point, kind of have almost a... Uh, not so much a negative feeling towards their fans, but sort of an anti-publicity, sort of want to be away from yeah, the I fan. Mean, well, I mean... You can't always deal with it. I mean, you can't always deal with being like, mobbed or something, but generally we're not. I mean, I always feel like our fans relate to us sort of on a different level as other bands, much more like they, they feel like they relate to us, and so they're respectful... Yeah, I, I got a note from a girl the other day that says, you don't know how hard it is to, to actually be a Smashing Pumpkins fan. Meaning, like, she gets a lot of crap from other people about it. So wow. we certainly feel we have a different affinity with people who like our band because they definitely can understand where we're coming from. So, But we don't get, like, mobbed very often or anything. People are generally polite and respectful and, you know. You never know, though. It could get out of hand. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, this is Dave Belcher from Olympia. What's up, Charles and Patty? Uh, yeah, I was reading some letters. <laughs> some letters. Another self-serving fan. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading some letters in response to your article in last month's CMJ magazine, which this guy says pretty much to stop whining because you make so much money about your troubled past. And I, I didn't agree with that letter. But how do you feel? That's about a pretty. It? That's a pretty typical. Like, you know, it's like the typical Rush Limbaugh response to to what we have to say. Um, I think if, if anybody's really read the things we've said, we've never really whined. We've whined about each other. <laughs> you know, that's a different thing. But uh, we've never whined about the success that we've had. We've never whined ab about fans. All we've said is, like, we just want people to be as honest as they expect us to be. And we have people come to concerts that don't really care about the Smashing Pumpkins, so why should we pretend otherwise? I mean, I, I think that... I think we owe it to the people that like our music to be absolutely honest and have great integrity. And, and if that seems like whining sometimes, that's just because people can't bear to hear the truth. The fact of the matter is, is we're all in, I mean, pretty much everyone I talk to is in basic agreement that alternative music is no longer really alternative, that uh, moshing has ceased to be a spontaneous activity. There's a lot of things about alternative culture that, are, that have passed on to the mainstream. So we can call a spade a spade and... and, and, and Move you know, on. And, and try to move on it and make for better music and, and better things and, and, and try to create better relationships between bands and fans. Or we can continue to the rock tradition of we're different from you are and you're not as cool as we are. And if, those, if that's the kind of bands you want to listen to, more power to you. But the bands I wanted to listen to are people that I could relate to. And that's always been our position. And uh, people, a lot of people don't like that. They want, they want their rock stars to be untouchable. And where we come from, where we stand for, it's never been what we're about. Billy, I remember hearing a uh, quote that you had mentioned about moshing and about how the, all it is these days is getting in a pit. It, you're moshing for the wrong reasons. How, did, how do the pumpkins That's feel? So over-intellectualizing it, but... <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> you're sick of moshing, you hate no, moshing. No, I mean, I mean we, 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 we were playing when, you know, in 1990 when people would go nuts because they never heard music like this before. They were really moved, not like it was the cool thing to do. It's really disgusting to us 
when we're playing one of our really slow, Disarm beautiful would be a good songs. One. <laughs> Disarm would Unless be a good example. They're like version. moshing, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, they're like body surfing. It's like they're not even paying attention. They're not. They've seen it on MTV and they want to be That's out there. Yeah, I mean, to do. we should know, you know beat a dead horse, but I mean, basically, we, we've just tried to say, hey, you know, if we're rocking you, then, and if you're moved, that's cool. But, uh, but certainly when you play a slow song and people are, are, are doing whatever it is they think they're doing, I mean... Let's start a new dance. The pogo is the a good pogo. one. The <laughs> pogo. Back in the Devo days. I mean, but, you know, but, I mean, it's like, so, you know, we don't want to be the, we don't want to be the voice of, like, the anti-moshing contingent. You know what I mean? It's like, we don't really care that much. But, we, you know, it's just one of, it's one of a hundred honest statements that we've made that somebody takes umbrage with because they think we're trying to tell people what to do. It's just, you know, it, it's... I've always respected people in bands. I mean, R.E.M. was a great example of a band that always spoke some kind of truth about rock and roll, and, and, and we feel a certain responsibility to speak that kind of truth. People don't want to hear that truth. That's fine. There's pl plenty of bands that don't like you. <laughs> Trust me. They don't really care about you. They're self-serving bands. They only care about what they're doing. And if they want to stare at their shoes and play music, that's cool. Pavement? But I would, <laughs> I'm not going to name and names. Ah, come no, on. I don't even care to name names. Shall we move on? Yeah. Your name, please. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm from Tacoma. And uh, first, I wanted to thank you all. Uh, thank you, too, for coming out and talking to us. Thanks and, for uh, coming, too. Really yeah, appreciate you guys doing definitely. this. It's kind of cool that you did this for us. And my um, uh, question for Billy, um, do you have any uh, uh, words of wisdom for, for musicians that are just starting out? Like, say, if you, you, know, you go back down the road and you think about it, you know, what things you might have done differently or labels you started out with or, um, you know, things that you, do, you did to start out with that, um, that got you where you are today. Um, do you have any words of wisdom to share with anybody else to start on that path down that yeah. road? Especially in the Northwest. There's a lot of years out there. Yeah. Um, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Um, just no, do it. it's not. <laughs> it's really <laughs> hard. No, 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 no. Philos it's a, it's a philosophically. See, this is, this is why we're in a band together. Um, it's actually philosophically pretty simple. Pisces, Taurus, Pisces, Taurus. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, okay, the best thing I could say is the things that we did that were right were we never deviated from what we did. We just played Smashing Pumpkins music. And believe me, there are plenty of people who told us we were way behind the times, way ahead of the times, copying trends. And we, you, if everything you can imagine someone could say that's negative about music was said about us in the first two to four years and, and occasionally still said about us. Second of all, we invested every bit of money that we made in playing shows and we played a lot of shows that we put on ourselves or booked around town we put everything back into making demo tapes and learning how to record and working on songs and we spent every available moment we could working on the band and that paid dividends because you know by the time that people finally started to come and see us we had progressed to a point where we were capable of making our own records and writing our own songs to the point where Gish was a was you know t only two years after Smashing Pumpkins started and it was a pretty sophisticated album because we'd made that much progression in two years Beyond that, I mean, it's just you've got to totally follow your heart. I mean, people told us to change the name. People told me to get rid of band members. People told me I shouldn't be singing. I mean, everything you can imagine negative was set, including from parents, friends, everything. And all I did was believe in myself and eventually in, in the band as an entity, and that's always served us really well. Billy, okay. you met James. You, you guys started the band together, James and right. yourself. Where did you meet? Um, he, he was actually playing with this kind of death rocker guy we knew Lenny and then we started this originally it was like a death rock kind of band it was me and James wouldn't me and Lenny were kind of death rocky and James was into the Smiths and James wouldn't follow the death rock plan and then when we went metal James still wouldn't follow the metal plan he still wanted to look like the guy in the Smiths and it took about two years before James would grow his hair long now you can't get him to cut it shall we move on let's do it your name I'm Jason from Seattle. Hi, hey, Darcy. Jason. Glad you came. Um, I was wondering how you guys decide which songs to play each night. <laughs> <Lottery. On> tour. <laughs> uh -huh. Next question. Uh, next question. <laughs> no, okay. it, it, it's actually, I mean, on this tour, if, if, if you uh, get a chance to come to the shows, um, we're pr on the new album, we're pretty much playing almost everything that we could possibly play. There's a pretty strong core, but it depends on our mood. Sometimes we'll make the set lists and even just change it as we go along, depending on our mood, depending on how the audience is. You know, we try and 
change it up because there are people who will go to the shows, different shows, and we don't want them to have to see the same thing, and we don't want to do the same thing because we get bored as well. So. Right. By the way, it's 107.7 The End, and the evening with Billy Corgan and very special surprise Darcy's here tonight with us as well in a room full of people with questions. And uh, do we have another we question? We got another one. Your name, please. My name's Tony. Uh, hope you enjoy your visit here. Um, wanted to ask you, when do you feel most inspired to write lyrics, and is it like, do you get excited, or is it a labor of love? Uh, that would be both. <laughs> <laughs> Squeeze them out sometimes. And well, sometimes you know, it's like... You know, from above. Like, sometimes I think, oh, I've got the best idea, and I write it down, and I go back later, and it's so terrible. I think, what the hell am I thinking? <laughs> you know? And then other times, I, it's like I totally have to f stick a crowbar in my gut, and, and out comes really good stuff. So, I, Lord knows how I write these songs. I have no idea. You know? I heard an interview once with you, Billy, where you were talking about not all the uh, lyrics of your music necessarily may have to do with true life things but it all comes from different experiences that you've sort of mixed up and made seem a little bit more obscure yeah well there's there's certainly an emotional truth you know to them all i mean not that i've lived every moment of those because i don't have time to live so if i had time to live i'd write about that but i don't think you want to hear about like I'm in another hotel room. And things, <laughs> things are real sad, and, and we have no the phone's life. not ringing, and we have no life. Hey! And then the chorus comes in, you know? I don't think you really want to hear about that, so we just sing about what our lives could be like. What they used to be like. Yeah, what they used to be like. The good what old did days. Back, to back when you were working in the sushi bar. Yeah. Are you cutting sushi? Cutting mm, fish? They, I believe she they was throwing me, it at people. Yeah. They wouldn't let me actually cut it, you know? Keep, keep Darcy away from the knives. Marco, are you done? I'm done. We have a question out here. Okay. One question, and then I think we need to uh, take a break. 107.7, the end right here. We got, right, we got room for one more? Yeah, let's do one more. What's your name? Katie. Um, besides the success and the fame and the fortune. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> Other than that. What's left? Okay. What, what sort of lasting inner reward has music given you? Well. <laughs> heavy. <laughs> Um, you want me to answer that one uh, there, Darcy? I think it's different for every person. You know, it depends on where you're coming from and where you're going. It forces you to grow up really fast. It's pretty much like throw you in sink or swim. You learn a lot really quickly and you grow a lot really quickly. And it's, um, you know, I guess well, we're hey. Another high Does that work? noise from yeah. the room here. Are we, are we going to take a break? Oh. Or just, Billy, oh. do you, did you want to answer that question as well? wait until after the commercial. No, go ahead, Billy. Oh. We're all right. <laughs> Other than that high pitch No, I, I mean, for, for me, I mean, I've thought about it a lot. And, and, um, and, and certainly I think the greatest thing is that we've always just been ourselves, you know. It, certainly, you know, there was a really weird time for us when after Gish came out and then, you know, Nirvana became so famous seemingly overnight and there were all these people questioning why we weren't that kind of band and why didn't we didn't write three minute songs and i'm really proud that we didn't like suddenly change our course and try and follow you know the grunge revolution into the sea you know I mean, we stuck to our guns and 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 i think that's why people respect us because we haven't jumped on that ship and now we're surrounded by eight thousand imitators and you know it's just a crazy world you know but at that time it would have been really easy to to do that because certainly there were bands from America that we would go to Europe and there'd be the words from Seattle would be bigger than the actual name of the band. I mean, people were selling where they were from and what label they were on and what movement they were part of more so than they were selling themselves. And people would assume that we were from Seattle and we would, we would have to say no. And they'd say, oh, you're a grunge band. We'd say, no, we're not, we're not. And it's like we, this went on a thousand times for years. And, and I'm really proud that we just, we've been ourselves. And at the end of the day, if we didn't sell another record, at least we'd be happy because we rocked and we certainly had a good time. We did it our way. <laughs> <laughs> do you think that uh, the Seattle rumor had anything to do with the Sub Pop single? The Afghan Whigs ran into the same thing. Oh, I remember sure. people thinking. Sure. I'm sure that was part of it, not yeah, I mean, that, the entirety. That didn't help. But, um, I mean, it was... It was I, it's hard to kind of put it all into words, but it was amazing. It was like we'd go to Europe and everybody was so enamored with this part of the world. 
and to not be from here was like almost like well we're not really interested in you <laughs> you know it was really a weird people thing used it to their advantage probably well, uh, trust me certain those people know who they are <laughs> it's an evening with billy corgan and darcy from the smashing pumpkins 107.7 the end we're going to take a break here uh grab something to drink you guys think of some more questions we'll be back after this all right it's 107.7 the end i'm marco that's bill an evening with Billy Corgan and Darcy of the Smashing Pumpkins. We're live at an undisclosed location here in Seattle. A very beautiful location at that. Uh, candles your, your, lit. Your living room is very nice. Man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, candles lit all over. We have a fireplace over here. It's, it's nice. Are you guys enjoying the environment? Did you, guys, did you guys get some free food upstairs, too? Free food? All right. It's catered. <laughs> This is nice. Uh, before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to uh, personally thank you, Billy and Darcy, for having Cheap Trick play with you live at the uh, big show that you guys broadcast. No, I'm we a thank huge them. Cheap Trick fan. We thank them. Let me tell you, we probably yeah. wouldn't be here. I mean, I can't tell you how cool it was for me to hear three Cheap Trick songs live, knowing that it was going on all over the nation and people having to air it. And I was like, yes, Cheap Trick on my radio station. So thank you guys. That was great. Yeah. You guys been, obviously, grew up being big fans. Yeah, I mean, we grew up in that horrible decade called the 70s, and um, <laughs> Cheap Trick was like, like literally like the nirvana of our youth. So. Heck yeah. Should have been anyway. Right or should have been, yeah. Other bands in Chicago that you guys are fans <laughs> of? Red Red Meat? Red Red Meat, Red absolutely, Red yeah. Uh, um, Urge Overkill. Baruch Assault. Um. You name it. Catherine. I have to plug Catherine. <laughs> Darcy's husband uh, plays drums. Oh, you're giving it away. The pl <laughs> Were you going to use that as a trivia question? End of the show. We're going to give away a couple pairs of tickets to tomorrow night's show. And I think uh, Darcy and Billy are going to come up with the trivia questions. None oh, of which we, we used on quiz? the air, mind you. We have a quiz at the end. Yeah. <laughs> drill them with a quiz. Yeah. I'm, I'm quiz. pumpkin trivia king. So. <laughs> want to go to our next question? I guess I won't yeah. win. What's your name? Hi, my name's Tim Hatch. Hi, Billy. Hi, Darcy. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question about um, if, if you guys would maybe ever be interested in maybe starting your own indie label, or, or are you? I mean... Darcy! <laughs> I didn't... I, I don't... Yes. We are. We have... We are scratchy, and uh, we have some pretty good bands. Uh, James and Darcy have and started my, a label. My in-laws and uh, some friends from New York, some good music. Isn't your mom putting out an album? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She plays the flute. <laughs> Next question. Your name? Hi, I'm Amy from Ording, Washington, and I heard that you guys were pretty upset when the video for 1979 got lost. How exactly did that happen? <laughs> uh, we would you like to ask the all. same question. <laughs> upset? <laughs> no. Um, the story we were told was uh, he who shall remain nameless uh, uh, was given the tapes to take to a, like a dubbing lab, and he put the tapes on top of his car in you a box. You know how you put your gas cap on top of your car when you're putting gas? <laughs> Never do that. And, put and it drive on away. He drove away in the... They found the box, uh -huh. and then they heard there was a ghost, and, and then the ghost of the man who got the tapes, and they had the cops looking, and they were announcing it on the radio. And, and you guys had to go back and reshoot it. Oh, yes. Yes, we did. We were, <laughs> that was the house scene in the video. It was right? worth it, though. Yeah, I mean... We uh, got at least a, a, a 30 more seconds. No, no. How about 10, 10 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> that 10 seconds you see of the party, that was four hours there, four hours back, driving there, driving, you know, so... It was worth it, though. <laughs> uh, next question. Your name? Uh, yeah, this is Peter Swansea from uh, Burian. I was wondering whether you ever think that Jimmy is sort of a discredited member of the band, being a really talented drummer. What do you mean discredited, though? Well, um, it seems I've seen a lot of pictures where he's in the background, and I have a, you know... Drummer syndrome. <laughs> yeah, <'cause> they're <laughs> yeah, waiting for him to blow up Don't be a drummer if you want to, you know... Uh, it gets screwed all I, I think, put it this way, I mean, uh, Jimmy... Jimmy personally is not that interested in the spotlight. I don't think Jimmy's that interested in, 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 in being recognized, but anybody who knows drums knows that and knows who Jimmy is. So. Honest to God, Jimmy Chamberlain is one of the best drummers in the world, quite literally. He really is. And he knows it, so he doesn't need... <laughs> I mean, here. not in a bad way. He, he doesn't need that. He has his own self-confidence, which is really healthy. He doesn't... 
need all that other stuff. He's, he's pretty cool letting, letting me and James hog all the pictures. <laughs> Your name? Uh, my name's Jessica Dillard, and I have two questions. I wondered if you found that um, your new ticket plan, or how you're selling tickets, have you found that that's more of a fan base now than before? Absolutely. And I was wondering who you guys have found to be, like, the most influential people in your music, like, you know, who you looked up to when you were young, and... Two-part question. Yeah. Well, I, I'll, answer the, I'll answer the ticket thing. I mean, I, I, I'm completely amazed, because we've done other small shows... I'm completely amazed at the amount of fans who are actually at the shows. And the way that we can tell is, you know, when we get about two hours into our show, you know, the whole place is still there, still watching the show. And there isn't a group of 150 people at the back at the bar, which is how it used to be when and we played small shows. And people talking over the shows. And nobody yeah. talks over the shows. It's like it's all fans, and it's been really great. And, and nobody moshes to disarm. No, that still happens. Still You'd happens. be surprised. <laughs> but um, um, the influences, mm -hmm. well... But they stay there. The show's really long, and they're still there. So they must really care. That's You're doing it. like a two-part kind of show. You take Don't an intermission, right? Oh, uh, sorry. No, the world knows. <laughs> right. Now we're doing a two-part show, yeah. and we come out and play about 45 minutes, kind of mellow-esque, and then we come out, take about a 20-minute break, and then we come back out and then beat your head in <laughs> with the metal. Your name, please? Jamie Arthur. And I had a question about, um, I heard you were writing a song uh, for Courtney Love to perform. Could you elaborate or explain or whatever? <laughs> is it true? Um, is the answer actually, is actually, Billy's written all Courtney's songs. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and wait, amazingly, no, she, no, she thinks she's written all Courtney. of mine. That's the other I love amazing Courtney, part. and that's not a mean song. That's that. just a joke. Yeah. You know, according to her, uh, Disarm was her song, um, which I, I don't remember her actually showing me, but that's kind of a funny thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, as far as this, uh, this song, there is a song that I wrote with her in mind. Yeah, and, actually. Uh, she, she made me so angry that I'm not going to give it to her at this particular moment. So <laughs> we'll see what happens to the song. What happened? You guys are still friends, though. Yeah, we're still very I heard close. Courtney came out and spanked you at the L.A. show live on stage. Was that true? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> I'm done. Next the great question. part was is nobody recognized her because, you know, because she's doing this movie and she's lost about 35 pounds. And it's not, like, it's not like she was big before, yeah, but she's like, like... black now. And she came on stage and nobody knew who she was. Oh, that's great. So that's not bad for the so most recognizable woman in America. You yeah. know? <laughs> it's the end, by the way, our evening with Billy Corgan and Darcy of the Smashing Pumpkins. Bill, to you. Your name, please. Ellen. Um, I've noticed that some of your lyrics, but particularly song titles, echo some of the passages in Kurt Vonnegut books. And I was wondering, particularly in Slaughterhouse Five, I was wondering if Kurt Vonnegut is a particular influence, or is that just coincidence? Um, you're the you're literally like the fourth person in the past five days that has cited an author as as an as an influence or an inspiration for my lyrics, and 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 I've never read any of those authors, so. <laughs> So either I'm tied into the universal spirit that is, uh, that is authorship or it's just sheer coincidence. It's I, me. I've, I've read it and I'm projecting it psychically into his brain. Next question. Your name, please. Dana. I've noticed a lot of religious references in your lyrics, and I was wondering if you're personally a, a religious person, and if so, do you believe in organized religion or do you believe that it comes from within? Ooh. Well, all those references to Jesus are really this guy I know, Jesus. <laughs> so, so don't, get, don't mistake that. And uh, I don't know. I, you know, the, the religious question is always a really weird one to me because I, I don't, I feel really uncomfortable talking about it. In it's public. not one of those things you're supposed to talk about in mixed company. I just, you know, if there is a heaven, I see me getting there and being yelled at. That's all I'll tell you. <laughs> I see, like, you know, like the book where they open it up and it's like, you said this naughty word nine million times, you know? <laughs> and you're like, no. And you're like, yes, yes, you did. You know? Your name, please. Sean Thayer from Bellevue. And I was wondering, um, after Space Boy, there's, like, a little excerpt from, a, I think it was an interview you guys did a while back. What exactly is that? Space Boy from Simon's Are Street. you talking about the, the Master Batori comment? Yes. <laughs> um... It's just this weird thing I found. <laughs> it's just this woman talking about her husband masturbating himself. I, I thought it was funny. 
it's really that simple. I mean, you know, everyone always like makes us out to be such ser serious people. You know, I just I thought it was a little funny in joke. Nick Brown, um, I was wondering why you guys picked Flood to produce Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness instead of Butch Big. Well, Flood producing Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness has a better ring to it than Butch Big producing Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. No, but seriously, um, um, Flood, because of the bands that he'd work with, like U2 and Depeche Mode, we felt could better do this crazy album. It's really kind of that simple. Now, um, when I had heard that Flood was working on the record, I was thinking, wow, there's going to be a big sound difference on this record and I think people were treated to that in fact I remember seeing a quote and uh, I'm not sure if it actually came out of your mouth or not Billy about what was being created here was comparable to the wall of the 90s well that was me shooting my mouth off before we actually recorded the album so <laughs> but uh, in terms of sound I mean 1979 is such a far cry from anything you guys had done in the past uh, was working with Flood an intentional thing because you knew you were going to go in that direction. Um, he might be it was kind of a guess. I don't, you know, I, 1979 was probably, the, or in fact, was the last song that I wrote for the album. So, doesn't it always work like that? It's kind of weird that way. Yeah, you know. And um, any indication of uh, the direction the Pumpkins might be going in? Um, you mean droning synth pop? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, my name is Angela Rainey, and I had a question as far as, I know a lot of your influences are like Cheat Trick and a lot of male people. I was wondering, is there a lot of female influences that you've listened to as well? Um, that would be my mother. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's the superseding influence of all. How about you, Darcy? Oh, oh, geez. Any women in rock? You'd be <laughs> Olivia Newton-John. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you got to remember the decade we grew up in. There were not a lot of strong uh, women at that time were portrayed mostly as sex objects in music, and there weren't a lot of really. I mean, Joan Jett was one of the few women who stood for something besides just pure. I mean, she looked good, but she rocked too. There wasn't a lot of that. And Deborah and, Harry, like Fleetwood Mac, you know. But even Deborah Harry was sold more That's as a true, sex object when you really look back at it. Right. Voice. Heart, maybe? Heart. You guys grew up with that? Yeah. Next question. You know, Hart, you know what's so funny though is like because Heart was such a, an accepted rock band, I almost never really even thought about them yeah. in, in terms of male or female. And that's the way it should. That's be. That's the way it should have been, and that's why I wouldn't even think to mention Heart because mm -hmm. they were at that time such an accepted rock band. Do you think that that's the way things are becoming more and Absol more? Absolutely. I mean, Darcy used to get asked the "What's it like to be a girl in the band?" Like <laughs> literally every interview four years ago. I mean, it was so redundant and so offensive. And, and, and either they fa finally figured out not to ask her that question or it's just ceased to be an issue. Let's go to our next question here. Hi, I'm Josh from Seattle. Um, and I was wondering how you guys feel about bootlegs and people taping your shows and that kind of stuff. I mean, is it like a big problem or is it something you guys just turn, the way, turn away from? We don't mind if they tape the good ones. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, In general... We pretty much think that the only people who are going to buy those are people who are so into the band that they already have everything else already. We got really bummed when they boot like the, like the shows that we did before the album came out. That was kind of a bummer. But Which I kind of wanted to ask you guys about, too. The lost Darcy yeah, tapes. Yeah, that was a drag. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? You just can't trust anybody. <laughs> Somebody you were close to? <laughs> yeah, somebody Thought basically so. living in her house was Ooh. stealing tapes, Ooh. demo tapes, and, uh -huh. and booting them, band rehearsals and things. And equipment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, you guys have done those live broadcasts that we aired here on the end in Seattle. A lot of people, a lot of excitement. What was it, the first song in, second song in? <laughs> yeah, that would be, I, I believe that outage. was the second song in, yeah. <laughs> and the great thing about it is I heard somebody screaming, you know, off mic because it wasn't being blasted right. out in the theater. But I heard somebody bashing around something and just yelling at the top of their lungs. I'm assuming that was you, Billy. No. No, we no. were laughing. We, were, we thought it was funny. <laughs> That's great. We, we were making jokes. It was like, uh, if you can imagine, you know, it's like, you know, we hadn't really played for about six or seven months. New album's coming out. We're really excited. 
hometown show, second song, Power Goes, and we're standing there going, yep, this would be pumpkin luck, yep, <laughs> national radio, you know, here we are, standing here, looking at our shoes, so. Telling jokes. <laughs> no, we thought it was, we thought it was really funny. No, the people were that were yelling were the people that were afraid they were going to lose their jobs. <laughs> Our tour manager. <laughs> <laughs> we go to another question here. Hi, my name is Robert Osgood. I'm from Renton. And I was wondering uh, what kind of a part are synthesizers and keyboards going to play in your next album? Um, we're, we're hoping to get to the point where we actually don't play anymore. <laughs> and we just, set, we, just send, we just send the robots out on the road. Next question. Hi, I'm Jamie, and I was just wondering what sort of um, films you guys like. I, Dar Darcy, I know you like Blue Velvet, and I really like your shirt. Besides from that, <laughs> thank you. I wow. mean the one she wore Old 400 times? <laughs> how, you, how could you guess? <laughs> oh, oh, what kind of films? Um, you like them crazy weird films, don't you? I, I you like, like, I like films. films for kids. I like little We're real big stuff. Disney fans. We Disney watch a lot of Disney on tour. I am dying to see that movie. Oh, it's great. My one of my favorite movies is like The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, you know, stuff like that. Um, I'm Shivali from Ordine and um like how did you write all twenty eight songs on Melancholy in six months? Um well it's actually I wrote fifty songs in about a year and a half. Uh -huh. Um basically I didn't do anything else and Darcy can attest to that. You know, she was like, why don't you get a life? Because all I did was stay in and work. That's really all I did. 28 songs must have been pared down from uh, a, a higher number. That's what I'm saying. I wrote 50, and James wrote probably another 12 to 15. We had a lot of, I mean, there's, there's, there's about 20 to 25 B-sides coming out yet that were all, weren't good enough to be on the album songs, you know. Right now? Um, I'm that Taylor Brown by the way. <laughs> and I was wondering why you and James don't sing that much, or don't sing more. I'm sorry, what's the question? Um, I was wondering why you and James don't sing more. Yeah, why don't you sing more? <laughs> <laughs> we could go to the next question if you want. <laughs> next question, next question. <laughs> I guess we're skipping that one. By the way, it's 107.7 The End, our evening with Billy Corgan and Darcy of the Smashing Pumpkins. <coughs> Hi, my name's Emily, and I was um, wondering if you had any special reason why you wear the shirt zero that says zero on it so much. Um, and how many do you have? Because it's the only one I got. <laughs> well, you know, there's reasons, but I think they're kind of obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Hi, I'm Mary Rose Hegstrom from Arlington, and I was wondering, after the song French Movie Theme, who is singing the national anthem? Yeah. Um, when we were mixing Siamese Dream, uh, Alan Mulder and Butch Vig and I would go to this karaoke bar in this horrible hotel we were staying in. And, and I used to have, I, used, I was in this weird phase where I was carrying around a portable tape recorder and I was taping people's conversations. And, and I had, and I had, and I had this recorder with, and this, this, this man who looked like the Marlboro Man got up on stage and proceeded to, and I knew something good was going to happen. So, <laughs> so I recorded him singing this, and, and, and it was just the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And fortunately, it's a, a really poor quality. But if you could have been there, he, he kept hitting himself in the head with the microphone. <laughs> uh, 